Hi, everybody, and welcome to part eight of our 10 part lecture series covering the GI unit for those of you studying for USMLE step one or complex level one. Today, we're going to talk about the pancreas. So, starting with anatomy of the pancreas, I'll go over some of the regions. This highlighted in red is the head of the pancreas. The only thing you have to know about the head of the pancreas is that a lot of pancreatic cancers arise in this region, and this can block the bile the uh, pancreatic duct and cause obstructive jaundice as well as the bile duct. The uncinate process is located here, so it's part of the head of the pancreas. You also have the neck, the body, and the tail of the pancreas. Moving on to other relevant anatomy and how the pancreas connects to the gallbladder and liver by way of these bile ducts. So let's go over that. Here at the top, you have your right and left hepatic ducts. What these do is they drain bile that's created by the liver. Those ducts will drain into what's called the common hepatic duct. And so that's a confluence of both of the right and left hepatic ducts. You have the cystic duct over here that connects the gallbladder uh, to the common bile duct. And speaking of the common bile duct, here it is. It's a formation of the cystic duct and the common hepatic duct. Now on your screen highlighted is the main pancreatic duct. And so this is our, because of the name, the main pancreatic duct is our primary pancreatic drainage. This can connect, as you can see right here, it connects with the common bile duct. And so from this point on, you'll have not only bile, and not only pancreatic enzymes, but a combination of both flowing through this region. I've also highlighted an accessory pancreatic duct right here, and it's a secondary drainage system, which is not connected to this bile duct. There's two papilla you have to know. The minor duodenal papilla is the region of the duodenum that can drain the accessory pancreatic duct. So our accessory duct right here can drain out the minor duodenal papilla. We have something called the ampulla of Vader. And this is look, this is right here at the distal end of the where the common bile duct and the pancreatic duct drain. And it widens here. That's why it's called an ampulla. Ampulla is like a widened vase that people used to drink out of. And so it widens here, and that helps to increase the outflow. And last thing, we have our major duodenal papilla. And this is what, what drains the main pancreatic duct and also drains bile that came in from the common bile duct. At that papilla, there's a, something called a sphincter of Odi. And this is a muscular layer that surrounds that duodenal papilla. And this can regulate outflow and prevent reflux. So it can, de depending on whether it's open or not, it'll determine how much fluid can drain from this region into our duodenum. Something you should realize that is that morphine can actually cause a sphincter of OD spasm. And so there's some old theory that you should avoid giving morphine for pain in pancreatitis because then you'll um, spasm your sphincter, which could actually worsen it because then the pancreas couldn't drain out. This has been a point of contention for many years, but they sometimes, you might get pimped on this. I don't I don't think I've seen this tested, but I have seen a lot of attendings mention this, especially on surgery rotation. So talking about hepatobiliary function, we'll go through exactly how bile and pan the pancreatic duct works. So the first thing that'll happen is liver creates bile, and this bile gets sent to the gallbladder. Uh, once the gallbladder is stimulated and it'll contract, and then that bile can flow down the common bile duct. Well, actually, we'll go in order. Cystic duct into the common bile duct, goes through the main pancreatic duct, goes in the ampulla of Vader, and into the duodenum, out that duodenal papilla and the sphincter of Odi right here. And so you'll get bile in your duodenum. While this is all happening, you have pancreatic enzymes that are getting secreted into both the main and accessory pancreatic ducts. And then these two can flow out that same outflow tract and into the duodenum. What I've done for this lecture is I'm going to break it down into an exocrine and an endocrine pancreas, and then we'll go over the conditions. 
since the pancreas plays two primary roles. So let's break down what the exocrine and the endocrine pancreas do. The exocrine pancreas is what we just talked about. This is where we have our pancreatic enzymes. They get secreted into the duct and that goes into the duodenum and then those enzymes can start working. The endocrine pancreas, on the other hand, um, is where you have hormones secreted directly into the bloodstream to exert an effect. And so we have these things called islets of Langerhans. And in this example, they're secreting a hormone insulin and it can go straight into the bloodstream. It doesn't have to go into this GI tract right here. So let's talk about the exocrine, exocrine pancreas and all that that entails. I want you to know a few different secretions that the pancreas uh, is responsible for. As you can see here, it's responsible for the secretion of pancreatic enzymes. So we'll talk about that. It also secretes bicarbonate and a, a combination of water and electrolytes. So I'm going to go over each of these three, um, the each of these three secretions, and I'm also going to go over especially how these secretions can be modified depending on you if you have low flow or high flow. So what we're going to do is we're going to zoom in on one of these ducts. So in these ducts, you have something called an acinus, which or a berry, and you have acinar cells that line that. You also have a duct, which as you the name suggests is lined by ductal cells. And the flow is gonna go from this direction. You're gonna be secreting stuff in this direction and it'll flow this way, just to get you an idea. So let's talk about the acinar cells first. These are the cells that secrete pancreatic enzymes. So there you can see some pancreatic enzymes being produced. And they also secrete water and electrolytes. So all of these can be uh, produced are secreted by the ACE in our cells. Ductal cells, on the other hand, are responsible for secreting bicarb. So there's some bicarbonate going into the lumen. And they can also modify pancreatic fluid. And I'll talk about the process of pancreatic fluid modification after I discuss this. So let's talk about pancreatic enzymes. So these enzymes that we just saw secreted by ACE in our cells, they get secreted in response to a couple different hormones, uh, namely CCK and acetylcholine. So in our small intestine lecture, we talked about eye cells that are, end up secreting cholecystokinin. These are cells that are located in our duodenum and jejunum. And then when we eat fatty foods or proteinaceous foods, you're gonna get uh, eye cells stimulated. And so once these eye cells are stimulated by fatty acids, let's say, they can secrete cholecystokinin, which has a few effects, but the biggest one you should know is that uh, the gallbladder can contract in the presence of CCK. That'll make this flow down into the uh, through the common bile duct out the major duodenal papilla and into the duodenum. But you also get pancreatic secretion and sphincter of OD relaxation, which as we've talked about, if you relax the sphincter of OD, you can get more outflow. Another thing it does is, is decrease gastric emptying, which is a little less important. What I really want to emphasize here is that CCK here, it causes pancreatic secretion, which is kind of what we're seeing in that slide beforehand. These All these secretions can be inhibited by somatostatin. That shouldn't be a surprise to you because somatostatin pretty much turns off any hormone or enzyme that you can think of. And so what kind of uh, enzymes do we have in our pancreas and what do they do? Well, first we have amylase, which is useful for starch digestion. We also have lipases that are useful for fat digestion. And we have several uh, enzymes that are useful for protein digestion, uh, trypsin, chymotrypsin, elastase, and carboxypeptidase to name a few. And it's important to note that most of these pancreatic enzymes are actually secreted as zymogens which are inactive precursors that require activation by another enzyme. So in the stomach lecture, I talked briefly about zymogens, and this is the slide I provided. And you can see here that we have pepsinogen, which you can see right here. And then trypsinogen is what I wanna talk about because these are actually secrete, this is secreted by pancreatic ACE in our cells. So trypsinogen is secreted, I mean, yeah, trypsin, 
which is the active form, is initially secreted as trypsinogen, which is an inactivated form. So here in the presence of cholecystokinin or acetylcholine, we're gonna have pancreatic enzyme secretion like we just talked about, but these enzymes aren't active yet. So they actually have to travel down to the duodenum. So here they come and now they're in the duodenum. And once in the du duodenum, there's other uh, enzymes such as enteropeptidase and enterokinase that can activate trypsinogen into trypsin. And once you have trypsin activ activated, trypsin can activate a ton of other prote uh, prote proteases. So let's just say these are other trypsinogen molecules. This trypsin can turn them on now. It could also turn on procarboxypeptidase into, into carboxypeptidase and a few other enzymes as well. So some things you should consider with trypsin, well, a few things we need to consider. First off, if you don't have these enzymes right here, enterokinase or enteropeptidase, you can run into some problems because you need these to activate trypsinogen into trypsin. So this might lead to protein malabsorption or failure to thrive because you don't have any activated pancreatic enzymes. In pancreatic insufficiency, you should consider that you don't physically have enough trypsin in your or trypsinogen in your secreted from your ACE in our cells. So that could also cause a protein malabsorption or a fat malabsorption. And then in pancreatic and pancreatitis, excuse me, you almost have the opposite problem where instead of having too few activated enzymes, you actually have too many and they're activated prematurely. And the problem with that is that if your uh, trypsinogen activates to trypsin within your pancreatic lumen without getting into duodenum, this can really damage your pancreatic ducts and cause a lot of damage to the pancreas itself. So I'll briefly talk about bicarbonate. We've kind of brushed on this before. I just want you to know that the ductal cells are the cells responsible for secreting bicarbonate right here. And how do they do that? So what happens is that S cells can produce a hormone called secretin. And again, we've talked about this. This is a slide from the small intestine lecture as well. S cells are located in the duodenum. And what they'll do is they'll produce secretin, which can increase bicarbonate secretion, which is what we're talking about right here. They also can decrease gastric acid secretions and they increase sphincter of OD relaxation. So it would cause more uh, bicarbonate to flow in. And the whole point of secretin is to basically neutralize all the acid in the stomach. And you can see that each of these three things does that in some ways. Adding more base will neutralize the acid. This will provide less acid anyways. And then this increased sphincter of OD kind of helps perpetuate the first one and allows all the bicarb to flow out that outflow tract. So let's talk about water and electrolytes now, as well as pancreatic fluid modification. So as you can see, the ACE in our cells are responsible for secreting all of these water and electrolytes. And what I want you to remember is that these electrolyte secretions are isotonic to plasma. So what does that mean? If you're isotonic to plasma, that means you have roughly the same concentration of each uh, electrolyte in the pancreatic lumen as you would in the blood. And so here you can see that this would be isotonic where you'd have a lot more of a concentration of sodium relative to chloride and potassium. So these, these numbers right here, you'd pretty much see being secreted from your ACE in our cells. Now, ultimately, when we see if you measure the electrolyte concentrations more distal in like the main pancreatic duct, for instance, you might not have an isotonic secretion necessarily, and you might not have the same concentration of each uh, electrolyte as you would in this spot. So I want to talk about how ductal cells can actually modify your pancreatic fluid. So let's go over pancreatic fluid modification here. I've just moved this over because I wanted to add a chart here to the right. On the y-axis, we're going to have the concentration of each, I, of each electrolyte. And here we're going to have the flow rate of the pancreas. So at high flow rates would be in this region, low flow rates would be in this region. So I've added each of the uh, electrolytes as well as water on here. So let's start with an easy one. So water can get secreted, as we've talked about before, by the ACE in our cells, and it'll flow down and it can get reabsorbed 
Um, and you don't really need to know too much about water. They don't test about how what happens with water in this, but I just know that it can be reabsorbed by ductal cells. Um, Sodium is also kind of boring. Remember from that previous slide about the concentrations, there's a lot more sodium than other ions. And that's why sodium is actually, if you look at our plasma, sodium is one, the most important osmol in our plasma because there's just so much of it compared to other electrolytes. And what happens here is sodium will flow down and if it tries to escape, it's not gonna be allowed out. So sodium, it's gonna start at a high concentration just because there's a lot of sodium in our plasma in general. And it won't get, uh, it won't be able to escape here, get excreted. So you're gonna have a steady state of sodium. Potassium's the same way. We have less of potassium in our plasma naturally. You know, sodium, if you measure it on like a basic metabolic panel, you'll get numbers like 135 or 140, whereas potassium, you get numbers like 3.5 or 4.5. So you can see there's like a pretty big difference there. And again, these if these guys try to escape, they're going to run into the same problem sodium had. So potassium, yeah, it has a lower concentration in general than sodium, but, and it's just going to stay very steady state. There's no change, no matter how, you know, no matter how big the flow rate is, even if you're, you know, pushing these potassiums as fast as they can, or as slow as they can, they can't escape this. Now we're gonna talk about the couple interesting things. So bicarbonate, as we talked about before, bicarbonate is secreted by ductal cells and it's, it's secreted in the presence of secretin. So S cells will produce secretin that'll act on the pancreatic ductal cells to produce bicarb. And this bicarb, as it flows down here, you can see, if it tries to escape, it actually can come back in, okay? So it can get reabsorbed. Now, the amount of bicarb reabsorbed will change depending on your flow rate. So at very low flow rates, if this is all moving very slowly down this way, what's going to happen is that you have more time for bicarb to sneak out. So you can see right there, a lot more bicarb had a chance to sneak out. So at low flow rates, you're gonna have a decreased amount of bicarb in the actual lumen. So we'll draw that here. At a low flow rate here, so this is like a, our low flow rate, you're gonna have a low level of bicarb. What happens at high flow rates though? So at high flow rates, everything's moving down this so fast that you don't have too much time for bicarb reabsorption. So you might get one more molecule there. But because of that, because you still have so much bicarb trapped in the lumen here, that tells you that at high flow rates, you're gonna have high concentrations of bicarb. And I'll show that one more time. So here at high flow rates here, you can see we're on the high flow rate side. We have a very high concentration of bicarb. And the nice thing about chloride is it's gonna do the opposite and I'll show you why that is. So if bicarb secreted here, bicarb gets, you know, starts to move distal and we know bicarb can reabsorb. What's gonna happen at low flow is that there's gonna be more time for bicarb reabsorption like we talked about. And why does chlorine have anything to do with this? Well, for every single bicarb that gets out and reabsorbed, you actually have an, a chloride antiporter that brings chloride into this lumen. So keep in mind, this was that low flow rates where a lot of bicarb can escape and get reabsorbed. You can see that because of that, we actually pumped a lot of chloride back inside this loop. So at low flow rates, we're gonna have very high concentrations of chloride. And vice versa, if you, if you think about the other way, at high flow rates, because there's not that much time for this bicarb to get out, you're not gonna have that much chloride that's getting secreted in through this antiporter. So at high flow rates, you can see there's very minimal chloride. And so it's good to have at least seen this mechanism once. You're not gonna get tested on the mechanism necessarily. They, they will ask you about the concentrations from time to time. So a good way to remember that, if you're not able to remember everything, I want you to remember that we've talked about this before a few times now, that the pancreas is great at secreting bicarb. It's a good neutralizer. And you saw how secretin helps in that process. And if you can remember that the pancreas produces bicarb, you'll, I hope you'll remember that a high flow rate would 
produce more bicarb. It's basically if the pancreas is working harder, I want you to just think about that as a more bicarb heavy environment. And then all you have to do is remember that chloride just does the exact opposite. So let's switch gears and talk about the endocrine pancreas briefly. So let's move on to the endocrine side and that's where we have our islets that get secreted directly into the bloodstream. So here's a picture of an islet of Langerhans. And islets of Langerhans are simply collections of neuroendocrine cells that are scattered throughout your pancreas. We're gonna go over each of the cell types. So alpha cells are the first type we'll talk about and they're coded in red here and they secrete glucagon. And so what I want you to know about glucagon is that glucagon increases your blood glucose levels, okay? And how I remember this is, is the mnemonic, you need glucagon when your glucose is gone. Because if you have low glucose, that's when you're gonna see glucose being, I mean, glucagon being released in order to increase our blood glucose levels. On the contrary, you can also have beta cells in these islets, and those, those are probably more, more famous and you can see them highlighted in blue here, and beta cells secrete insulin. And insulin is responsible for decreasing your blood glucose levels. Insul so, and I remember that as insulin brings glucose into cells. I always think of insulin as my storage hormone. It's gonna try to package up everything in, into a bigger molecule. It doesn't like free glucose and anything like that. Okay, let's move on to delta cells. So delta cells secrete somatostatin. And somatostatin, as we've talked about before, it inhibits the secretion of many, many hormones. And I always remember somatostatin as somatostopin. And I, I don't have a cell type for it specifically, but I just want you to realize that these pancreatic islets also secrete other hormones on occasion, such as gastrin and VIP. And when we talk about the pancreatic islet cell tumors, we're gonna find out that all of these hormones that we've discussed can be responsible for some sort of neuroendocrine tumor. But for now, what I wanna just focus on from the physiology side of it is this mechanism by which beta cells are able to secrete insulin into our bloodstream. So here I've, I've shown you a beta cell and we're gonna talk about how insulin gets produced and secreted into our bloodstream. So the first thing that's going to happen is that glucose that's uh, in the bloodstream can enter the beta cell. Once in the beta cell, this glucose is converted into ATP, just like any other fuel or any other cell could. And this ATP is going to act on a potassium channel. So what I want to say before we move on is that these potassium channels it, as you can see, they're pushing potassium outside, okay? And if you can imagine a bunch of positive ions leaving the cell, what's going to happen is that this space here will become more positive, whereas the inside will become more negative because you're losing a positive charge. And if you have a cell that becomes more and more negative, it's going to actually hyperpolarize the cell and make it less likely to perform an action potential. ATP, though, blocks this process. And so instead of all these potassium escaping, escaping out here, you're going to get potassium building up here. So you're going to get positive charge building up within your cell. So this increased positive charge inside the cell will ultimately depolarize your beta cell and cause an action potential. What's going to happen at once your cells depolarized, calcium is going to enter the cell and then calcium can actually release insulin into the bloodstream and help with the vesicle release into the bloodstream. And this physiologically makes a lot of sense because if you have a ton of sugar in your bloodstream, what's going to happen is this process will actually give you a lot of insulin, which can counteract that, and it'll force cells to take in glucose into their cells, and you'll be able to regulate your blood glucose levels that way. Some other things I want you to consider is that, and we'll talk about this later on as well, is that sulfonylureas inhibit potassium channels to facilitate this release. So they do the exact same thing that, that this whole ATP and natural glucose does in that it'll inhibit the same channel. That'll also 
called potassium release and then uh, calcium release and then insulin release ultimately. Another thing I want you to realize is that C-peptide is released whenever beta cells actively secrete insulin. So as long as beta cells are doing the secretion of insulin, like packaging it into these vessels, you're gonna get C-peptide released as well. So here's a vesicle here. If that's released, if it releases insulin, it's gonna release C-peptide. This can happen in three different ways, okay? So we've talked about two of the ways already. The first way is that natural insulin production. So you have glucose coming in and going through this whole process that we've talked about first, in this process, you're gonna get C-peptide released. Another thing that we briefly mentioned again is that if you have a sulfonylurea blocking this uh, potassium channel, again, you're still gonna get natural release of calcium and natural vesicular release of insulin. So you'll get C-peptide as well. The third thing, and I'll talk about this when I talk about pancreatic islet cell tumors, is that in insulinomas, your own beta cells are hypersecreting insulin. So because it comes from your own beta cells, you're going to see elevated C-peptide. I'm not going to do a full section on diabetes right now. If I ever do an endocrine lecture section and this series is well received, then I would give a full but diabetes talk, but I don't want to bog you down with all that. I just want you to know on tests, you should look for the classic polyuria, polydipsia, polyphagia, and weight loss for somebody with diabetes. Every, you know, peeing a lot, drinking a lot, all that stuff. In type 1 diabetes, just know that it's from a lack of insulin production, so we don't even have our beta cells in the first place, whereas type 2 is more about insulin resistance where you have the beta cells producing a ton of insulin, but your other cells aren't reacting to it. And so sugar is just sitting in your bloodstream. Some, some nice pearls that you should realize, if you ever have somebody with diabetes and bronze skin, I want you to consider hemochromatosis. If you ever see somebody with late onset diabetes, I'd start thinking about a primary pancreatic disorder like pancreatic cancer or chronic pancreatitis. And it's really important to, if you have to review it, you can, the, the, the mechanism that we just discussed about of how insulin gets produced and excreted. This is especially important, and I'll have a practice problem later when they, they test you about insulinomas versus normal insulin use versus exogenous insulin versus sulfonylurea use. I go over that later, so that, but that's why this mechanism is so important to know. Let's move on to all the clinical conditions that involve the pancreas. There's not as many as most units, but so but I think pancre acute pancreatitis is the most high yield and probably the most dense of the subjects. So let's go over it first. So as the name suggests, acute pancreatitis is inflammation of the pancreas, and this results due to autodigestion from those activated trypsinogen molecules turning into trypsin. So here's our model that we talked about before. Just remember that these right here are, are already activated and these are appropriately activated in the duodenum where they should be exerting their effect. But if we have activation prematurely, you can get reactivation because remember this trypsin can activate a trypsinogen into it. So you get this positive feedback loop and over time this can cause serious damage to your pancreas. It'll cause two types of necrosis, and this is sometimes tested on step one. It'll cause liquefactive necrosis of the pancreas and fat necrosis of the nearby peripancreatic fat. So what does that mean? Liquefactive necrosis is a type of necrosis in which your cells are digested. And just so we know, necrosis versus apoptosis, I learned it as apoptosis is cellular suicide, where your cell knows it's in trouble, it, it knows it was infected with something. So it basically starts to shut down in a very organized manner, packages it up and makes sure it dies in a way that doesn't damage other cells. Necrosis is just, your, it's cell death. It's your cells are dying for whatever reason. There's no rhyme or reason to it. It's not trying to slowly package it up and go through this process. It's usually dying and it's a pretty, it, it can be a pretty chaotic process. So 
as you can see here in liquefactive necrosis, dead cells are forming this liquid mass. You'll see this in the pancreas and you'll also see this in the brain as because that also have liquefactive necrosis is, is stereotypic of that region. And so another thing we should talk about is fat necrosis though. So what happens here is that as the inflammation progresses, you can affect the nearby peripancreatic fat. And then in fat necrosis, you'll have fatty acids and triglycerides getting released from this damaged region now. So that's, those, those, it's important to distinguish, excuse me, both of those types of necrosis. So what causes acute pancreatitis? The most common cause of pancreatitis is our gallstones, followed closely by alcohol exposure. You can also have hypercalcemia that causes this, hypertriglyceridemia, an ERCP can cause it, mumps can cause it, and several of the cases are simply idiopathic where we don't know exactly what's going on or why it's causing it. And there's a lot of other causes. You'll hear like scorpion bites, and I think I have a slide right here, yeah. So here's a slide of mentioning most of what we talked about. Don't forget autoimmune pancreatitis, trauma. Sometimes they test this. This is more of a step one thing where they want you to know if you're bit by a scorpion or a brown recluse. I I was I'm gonna say it was low yield, but I would actually know the brown recluse specifically. They I've seen this tested before. I know I've had practice problems on this. Brown recluse spider bite causing acute pancreatitis. They do like that from time to time. What I wanted to do though is I, I specifically put these causes in because I want to talk about why they happen and, and just so you have a, a better sense of what's going on. So in gallstones, what's happening is pretty straightforward. A gallstone, as you remember, the common bile duct meets up with the main pancreatic duct. So you, if a gallstone makes it all the way down and lodges itself in there, you can have a blockage of your main pancreatic duct. And what will happen there is that over time, your trypsinogen molecules can get activated and they can cause damage. In alcohol, the mechanism's low yield, but just know that you'll secrete additional pancreatic enzymes here. I'll show that one more time. Basically, it increases your pancreatic enzyme secretion, alcohol does, and then it causes inflammation. You just need to know that it's it's the second most common cause of pancreatitis. Don't worry about the mechanism. Hypercalcemia, you'll have calcium that can activate your trypsinogen molecules, so that'll cause damage. Hypertriglyceridemia, you can get triglycerides that get broken down into free fatty acids. And these can independently damage your pancreas without needing to activate trypsinogen. In an ERCP, just so you can see what that is, basically, if you ever have a gallstone stuck, you can take a device. Um, a GI doctor can take a device and can try to basically dislodge this gallstone, but in this whole process can cause pancreatitis. So which is kind of ironic because usually you're doing this in a patient who has pancreatitis and you're trying to help them. But yeah, sometimes the the solution causes more of the problem. And just to reiterate with those, what you just talked about, you actually don't need to know the mechanism. I'm just trying to show you it just for your own learning. So you can see why you would actually get pancreatitis. You just need to know that these are causes. And the last one I wanted to just mention is mumps as a classic cause of pancreatitis. This is from our oral cavity lecture, which was a while ago. And I just wanted to remind you that in our mnemonic that I talked about with mumps, that stands for mumps, orchitis, aseptic meningitis, pancreatitis, and then parotitis. Okay, so let's move on to how somebody with acute pancreatitis will actually present and what you can do to find out if they actually have that. So the classic pain pattern is somebody who has epigastric pain radiating to the back, and they will give you this in this question step. So once you hear that, I want you to immediately think pancreatitis. You'll also have somebody with nausea, vomiting, loss of appetite, so think about all that. On laboratory findings studies, you'll find elevated amylase and lipase, they like to ask which one is more specific, and the answer is lipase because li you don't have a salivary lipase, so it's more lipase is more specific than amylase. 
you'll often find an elevated white count, which doesn't surprise you because any itis can have an elevated white count. You'll have cholestatic liver function tests, which just means you'll have the liver function tests that are consistent with some sort of obstruction. So if I go here, I, I talk about this in the upcoming lectures, the hepatobiliary and the liver lecture. But what's happening is that bile is composed of several different compounds, some of which, some of these compounds also travel with the bile to escape into the duodenum. So if they get, go here, the, the gallbladder will contract and along with the bile, you'll get alkaline phosphatase, conjugated bilirubin and uh, GGT. The problem is that if you had like a gallstone per se, let's say, then nothing can flow out here and it'll instead flow into the bloodstream. So you'll get elevated alkaline phosphatase, elevated GGT, elevated C. bile, and that'll that explains the cholestatic LFTs. That's what that that's what that means. And keep in mind, this would only happen if you had gallstones as your cause of pancreatitis. If you had another cause of pancreatitis and bile was still able to flow out the common bile duct into the main pancreatic duct and out into the duodenum, then you wouldn't see cholestatic LFTs, but in gallstone pancreatitis, you would. Some prognostic indicators that you should be aware of is that hypocalcemia and elevated BUN are both four, prog pro four prognostic indicators. So let's talk about each of those. So in hypocalcemia, why, why would that happen? So we already know that you can get inflammation of your pancreas. Nearby, you have that peripancreatic fat. And when that peripancreatic fat also gets inflamed, you can get hypocalcemia because these fat molecules love to bind to calcium and they'll take up all the calcium that's in your bloodstream and they'll bind to it. This is a slide from a previous lecture on Crohn's disease and as you can see here, the reason you get calcium oxalate stones in your, um, well, well, actually, the reason why you get calcium oxalate stones is because you have a lot of oxalate that enters your bloodstream. This happens because you have a ton of free fatty acids, and these free fatty acids love binding up calcium that allows oxalate to escape. The same thing's happening in acute pancreatitis where you have a bunch of free fatty acids that end up being released into your bloodstream because of that inflammation. And all those free fatty acids that make it into your bloodstream bind to the free calcium that's in your bloodstream and give you hypocalcemia because the calcium measured won't detect these calciums anymore. So the elevated BUN is a little bit more straightforward. All you need to know is that if you have persistent inflammation like this, you're always any time you have inflammation, you're because you're losing intravascular volume. Volume's just kind of leaking out, basically. And whenever volume leaks out like this, and you lose a lot of your volume, less of that uh, intravascular volume will reach your kidneys, and you're going to have an elevated BUN. This is less important for step one or level one, but I do want to mention that there are different criteria that you, you can use to assess the, the prognosis of somebody with pancreatitis, Ransom's criteria or the Apache two scores. I'm not gonna go into each of these scoring systems, but it's worth, worth it to at least look it up if you have a patient with pancreatitis, just to stage them. On examination, there's a couple classic things they want you to know. Uh, first off, they want you to know abdominal tenderness, but what's more important are these signs. So there is a couple signs, colon sign and gray Turner sign, which I have pictured here. So colon sign on the left is our periumbilical ecchymoses. And I want you to remember colon for umbilicus. And you can see this, this bruising right here near the belly button. Gray Turner sign on the other hand are flank ecchymoses. So this is on the side or flank. And I want you to remember this by the phrase, you turn to your side. And that should tell you that gray turners is for side bruising. So how do we diagnose acute pancreatitis? It has a very 
uh, straightforward diagnostic criteria, you need two out of the following, okay? So at least two out of these three. Epigastric pain radiating to the back is number one. You need an elevated amylase or lipase, and it has to be at least three times the upper limit of normal. Or you can have characteristic imaging findings. So as long as you meet any two of these three, you have a diagnosis set. And oh, just to mention, so I talk about characteristic imaging findings. Sorry to go back and forth. Here is a normal pancreas, and you can see this nice demarcation. It's a very small uh, pancreas. But over here, you have a lot of edema, and it looks boggy and unclear. And so that's what you're going to see in a case of acute pancreatitis. How do you treat this? So you treat it by not giving them any food because it's going to make the problem worse. You should give them IV fluids like we just talked about. Any inflammatory, uh, any inflammatory pathway or disease can ultimately decrease your intravascular volume. So IV fluids can be very helpful in reversing that and making sure somebody still is resuscitated. And you should also give pain control. And I just want to remind you that the old, the old uh, guidelines stated that you shouldn't give morphine because it can change the sphincter of OD and cause spasms, but that's that's hasn't really been as true as it was hypothesized. Just wanted to let you know. So let's go over a practice problem to solidify our diagnosis and treatment for pancreatitis. So let's say we have a 52-year-old male with uh, cholelithiasis, or that, which is gallstones, presents to the ED with severe epigastric pain radiating to the back. On labs, we notice an elevated white count and significantly elevated lipase. We also notice these cholestatic labs that we talked about before of elevated alkaline phosphatase and conjugated bilirubin. And so now, what's the next best step in management for this patient? Would you scan them to evaluate? Would you just observe them? Would you do a right upper quadrant ultrasound? Would you do an exploratory laparotomy? Or would you e cry profusely because you forgot how to diagnose pancreatitis? Well, I have more faith than you all, but the first answer is, this answer is gonna be right upper quadrant ultrasound, okay? Let's talk about why that is. The first thing we should rule out is e because y'all are smarter than that. And I, I, I totally trust that you at least knew it wasn't one of these, okay? We know the treatment for pancreatitis is to be NPO, to give IV fluids, and to do pain control. So we shouldn't assume that we're going to give somebody a surgery right away for this. And we also shouldn't just observe them because there's a little bit more to it than that. Next thing I want to talk about is why A is wrong, because A looks very, very appealing. We just talked about characteristic imaging findings on a CT scan. Well, in this case, we already have two out of our three findings. We have our severe epigastric pain radiating to the back. That would be number one. And we have a significantly elevated lipase. That would be number two. The, the next thing I wanna to mention to you all is that this person has the history of gallstones and they have L, the, those cholestatic LFTs, which is are very sus highly suspicious for some sort of gallstone pancreatitis. So the best way to view this is to get a right upper quadrant ultrasound to evaluate for gallstones and to see if there may be a component of gallstone pancreatitis playing a role here. It's less about diagnosing that we are we've already diagnosed pancreatitis. Now we're trying to find out the cause of the pancreatitis. There are a few local and systemic complications that they do like to test for step one. So a pancreatic pseudocyst is a collection of pancreatic fluid surrounded by granulation tissue. These usually take a few weeks to form, so at least four weeks to form. And they're common in the lesser sac posterior to the stomach. Because these cysts can get very large and stay for quite some time, they may require drainage if it's if it's large enough 
because the walls aren't super strong. So what does that look like? So what's happening here is that we have all these digestive juices and liquefactive necrosis going on when you have this inflammation. And if it if the inflammation continues and you actually have a almost like a fistula here forming from the lumen, you can start getting a leakage of fluid and this can grow into this collection that's surrounded by granulation tissue. And keep in mind, like we talked about before, this can take on the order of weeks sometimes. It's a very slow process. And just so you know what granulation tissue is, it's simply, I would just consider it as a form of connective tissue. So it's a mixture of connective tissue here. And here you can see a very large pancreatic pseudocyst right here. And so let's move on to a pancreatic abscess. That's an infection of that pseudocyst. And in these patients, you're going to see a fever and failure to improve in somebody who has recent pancreatitis. And this will require an incision and drainage if, if it's greater than six centimeters or if it's present for more than six weeks. So there's like a little six and six rule for this one. So going back to our pancreatic pseudocyst, this time, what if the pseudocyst gets infected? So the so if it gets infected and you have a pancreatic abscess, just remember you have to drain it if it's been there for over six weeks or if it's greater than six centimeters in size. And these aren't you know, these aren't hard and fast rules, but on boards I would I would go with this. That's more of a step two thing though. So just keep that in mind. Acute necrotizing pancreatitis is widespread liquefactive and fat necrosis to the pancreatic tissue. And you're, in these cases, you might require sir, uh, our antibiotics, but I just want to let you know, antibiotics are technically only required if you have an infection identified on biopsy. This, this guideline has changed over the past few years, so I don't think they'll test it. And may, maybe by the time you're watching it, it will have already changed back. So I don't know. But I just wanted to include what the current guidelines state regarding antibiotics and acute necrotizing pancreatitis. So that looks like if you have really bad inflammation all over the place, ultimately this can cause necrosis where your cells all die. And that is, yeah, that is not good. Very low yield disease though in general, because it's pretty straightforward. These systemic complications, you really only see, they only test you it in the context of acute pancreatitis for most of these. But I think they're useful to go over each of these three because they're going to be high, uh, really important later on. And this one's important for pretty much any inpatient rotation you'll ever do in your life. So SIRS, systemic inflammatory response syndrome, this is whole body inflammation. So this, a lot of people think it's infection and it could be due to infection, but it could also be due to ischemia, other inflammation or trauma. So it's an exaggerated immune response to some stressor. And as we just talked about, it can be caused by many different things. And the SIRS criteria is very straightforward. There's four categories and you just need to be two or more need to be positive to be SIRS positive. So for temperature, you, your temperature normally is 37 degrees Celsius. So if you're less than 36 or above 38, you'd get a point. If your respiratory rate's greater than 20, heart rate greater than 90, and then your white count, again, there's a there's a double category. So it's either greater than 12,000 or less than 4,000. So if you have two of any of these four, you'd be SIRS positive. And then the next step, if you have a SIRS positive and you think they're infected, you need to look for a source. So if you ever have SIRS and a suspected source of infection, you'd have sepsis. And that's all you need to know for step one. Just know that if you ever have sepsis and then you also notice end organ damage, then you have severe sepsis. If you ever have sepsis and you start becoming hypotensive, requiring pressors because fluids aren't working, then you'll have septic shock. But just know, SIRS, and this is the complication of pancreatitis specifically, you have all this inflammation. You can even get an exaggerated immune response to that, and you'll ultimately have SIRS. Uh, ARDS is a life-threatening fluid accumulation in the alveoli due to damaged epithelium. 
and it'll cause a classic non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. So let's talk about both of these concepts. So on the left, we have our alveoli and we have a pulmonary capillary. And we haven't talked about the lungs, but just note that you're at the very, very distal ends of all your lung sacs. You have these little grape-like clusters called alveoli. And they're wonderful because they are the part that talks directly to your bloodstream and make sure that your O2 and your CO2 are balanced correctly. So what's gonna happen is that from the alveoli, you get all breath of fresh air, you breathe it in and you have all this oxygen coming in, it reaches your alveoli and it can go straight into your bloodstream. At the same time, these capillaries are able to dump their CO2 straight into your alveoli and ultimately you'll exhale that CO2. So what happens in ARDS is that you have this damaged epithelium right here. And what's gonna happen is that all the fluid that's within our pulmonary capillaries, it can now see this damaged epithelium and it starts to leak out and into our alveoli. Remember, we just needed our alveoli for that gas exchange, that CO2 and O2 gas exchange. So if you have all of this water here, it's obviously gonna have an effect on your breathing and several other factors. So I wanna talk about non-cardiogenic versus cardiogenic pulmonary edema and talk about what happens here. So in cardiogenic pulmonary edema, we have our lungs, which the blood goes from the lungs to the heart, back to the body, and ultimately back to the lungs later. So if your heart's not working, let's say you have heart failure, what's gonna happen is that we can't get all the blood flowing from our lungs to our heart. So it's gonna back up in this region and as it backs up and the pressures grow, you're gonna get cardiogenic pulmonary edema because of that back pressure. And you can measure this if you take the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, which is just our left atrial pressure, you'll notice that it's a lot larger. So if your heart's not pumping well, that would mean more fluid would stay in the heart and you'll have an elevated PCWP. And ARDS, it's a form of non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. So in this case, we're getting fluid in our lungs, but it's not because our heart, it's not a cardiogenic pulmonary edema. It's simply because we have damaged epithelium within our lungs that's causing that fluid accumulation. So again, fully functional heart, normal pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. Here's a picture of ARDS. This is what it's, they're gonna show you a picture like this if they give you ARDS. And it's just gonna look atrocious. You could see all the inflammation all over. And ARDS is extremely dangerous with almost a 50% mortality rate. Moving on to the next one, uh, DIC, so disseminated intravascular coagulation, is a, also a very dangerous disease. So this is what's referred to as a consumptive coagulopathy. And it's called consumptive because it's gonna end up consuming platelets, coagulation factors, clot inhibitors, among other things. And you're gonna see a combination of bleeding and thrombosis in this condition. So in DIC, What's exactly happening? We just talked about how there's consumption of clotting factors, inhibitors, and platelets, which is why it gets its name of a consumptive coagulopathy. And it can be caused by several different conditions, but most of, most of which are very life-threatening. And in this case, we're talking about pancreatitis. So let's go over the clotting cascade, which we all know and love, and talk about DIC's pathogenesis. So here we have the intrinsic pathway and the extrinsic pathway. And you can see here that their common denominator is factor 10. And ultimately their goal is to turn factor 10 into factor 10A. Once that's done, it goes through another series of steps. And what I want you to know is that ultimately fibrinogen gets converted into a fibrin clot. So everything you've seen here, the whole point of this cascade and this cascade is just to form a nice stable fibrin clot. And fibrin kind of looks like a fishnet. 
a very nice mesh. So I always think of it as the fibrin fishnet. And that's all this clotting cascade does. It's really designed to, to give you this nice stable fibrin, uh, fib fibrin fishnet mesh. Let's take a step back and see what happens in DIC. So in DIC, you have systemic release of tissue factor, which is right here, this TF. And keep in mind that tissue damage can release tissue factors. So oftentimes a lot of these causes has so much widespread tissue damage that that's what's releasing all this crazy amounts of tissue factor. So that tissue factor can start activating the clotting cascade. So factor 10 is turning to 10A. And ultimately, as we just talked about, you're gonna get more fibrin fishnet clots coming through if you're having more of this factor 10A. Now, over time, a few things will happen. So the first thing that's going to happen is that clotting factors and fibrinogen are depleted due to all these fibrin clots forming. So you can see that thrombin's been working its butt off trying to produce, you know, trying to move along this cascade. Fibrinogen's been working hard, but at some point there's going to be so many stable fibrin clots that you're going to run out of the materials to use to make them. At some point, you're going to have so many fibrin clots that you're going to run out of the materials to make them. While this is all going on, it's not like our body just lets you make a bunch of fibrin clots and doesn't have a counter regulatory mechanism, right? So we actually have a lot of clotting factor inhibitors that will break down fibrin clots to make sure that we're not having too much of a hypercoagulable state. Again, though, there's so many stable fibrin clots that even these guys struggle sometimes. Oh, another thing I wanted to mention before I move on is that all of these inhibitors, if they're degrading fibrin clots, they break them down into what's called fibrin degradation products, one of which being D-dimer, which you may have heard of in the past. But again, over time, if, if all these clotting factor inhibitors are working hard and there's just too many stable fibrin clots, you're going to run out of these inhibitors one day. Last thing I want to mention is that platelets become trapped in these fibrin clots. And those can, if those are trapped, then you also lose platelets and you become thrombocytopenic. I just came back to this slide really quickly because I wanted to point out something that's happening here. So what's happening here? A, we're losing all of our clotting factors, right? So if you lose your clotting factors, and we're losing platelets, we're more likely to bleed. Another thing that's happening though, is that we're also losing a lot of clotting factor inhibitors, which makes us susceptible to clotting. So it's this weird condition by which we are actually more prone to clotting and more prone to bleeding at the same time. So for the symptoms, you're just gonna have clotting symptoms, like ischemia, thrombosis, or end organ damage. And you also may have bleeding symptoms. And so this is, you'll classically see somebody who's just bleeding from all of their lines and you can't get the bleeding to stop. That's what a question stem where you should strongly consider DIC. On laboratory findings, you're gonna find an elevated PT or PTT, decreased fibrinogen, elevated D-dimer, and a decreased platelet count. So going through each of these four, elevated PT or PTT, I just wanna remind you that PT is a measure of your extrinsic pathway. And I remember this by the mnemonic that you play tennis, you play tennis outside. So that's why the extrinsic pathway measures PTT, I mean PT, excuse me. And if you have a damage to tissue factor here, then you can get an extrinsic pathway deficit. PTT measures the intrinsic pathway, which is located up here. And my mnemonic for this is that you want to play table tennis or ping pong indoors. And I didn't do a great job of showing this, but when you have too much thrombin, this can activate other clotting factors and if these are overactivated and overworked, you'll start to become depleted in them, 
and you'll get an intrinsic pathway deficit and an elevated PTT. Fibrinogen is very straightforward. If we're making all of these stable fibrin clots, we, we're losing a lot of fibrinogen. So you can see right here, fibrinogen is very low because we've had to use so much of it to make these stable fibrin clots. D-dimer also makes sense. We talked about how our clotting factor inhibitors break down fibrin into these fibrin degradation products. So you'll get a lot of D-dimer in patients who have DIC. And then decreased platelet count. Again, very straightforward. These platelets get stuck in the clot and you get thrombocytopenia. To treat this, remember there's several causes of, of DIC. It's not its own entity. It's like a symptom of another condition. So the real important thing is to treat the other condition. And in the meantime, you still might have to give transfusions, factor replacements, or anticoagulation depending on their symptoms. Besides DIC, ARDS, and SIRS, I just wanted to mention that you can also have hemorrhage, shock, multi-organ failure in patients with severe acute pancreatitis. Now we're gonna move from acute pancreatitis to chronic pancreatitis. So in chronic pancreatitis, we have chronic inflammation. And as we've seen in a few other conditions, that chronic inflammation can lead to fibrosis and ultimately atrophy of the pancreas in this case. As you might have thought, chronic pancreatitis is often due to recurrent episodes of acute pancreatitis, but it could also be idiopathic or secondary to things like alcohol abuse or cystic fibrosis. So here you can see that if you have this chronic inflammation in this area, sometimes it heals up, but other times you have this chronic inflammation and you'll get fibrosis and scarring. So the features, what does that look like? Again, that's going to look like that epigastric pain we saw before that radiates to the back. Another common thing they like to mention is that you might have pain that worsens after eating, presumably because you don't have enough bicarb to neutralize it, among other things. And so you're going to get weight loss over time because you're due to food avoidance. The labs differ a little bit in chronic pancreatitis because you can't rely on amylase and lipase as much. If you think about it, in acute pancreatitis, you'd expect amylase and lipase to be very elevated because you're secreting some of your overactive trypsin molecules are entering your bloodstream and you'll see those. However, in chronic pancreatitis, because you're secreting so few enzymes in the first place, even if they do have a little overactivation, it may just appear as normal or low for you on a lab test. On imaging, you're going to have a uh, characteristic chain of legs pattern due to pan pancreatic duct dilatation or pancreatic calcification. And here you can see the ducts right here. This the, here's your pancreas. You can see this chain of length, chain of legs. Excuse me formation. Some complications you should be aware of. One is pancreatic insufficiency. This should make some sense. Normally you have a, a collection of enzymes that are secreted, lipases, proteases into the lumen. But if you have so much pancreatic damage, you're not going to have all these enzymes anymore that are being released into the lumen. Another complication to keep in mind is that you can get secondary diabetes. So what happens here is that this chronic inflammation damages all pancreatic tissue. It's not just the acinus and the ducts. It can also damage your nearby islets of Langerhans. And if those get damaged, you could potentially have secondary diabetes if enough beta cells are injured. There is an increased risk of pancreatic cancer with chronic pancreatitis. And this, this isn't unique to just pancreatitis. This is pretty much anything with chronic inflammation can cause some sort of cancer. We saw chronic inflammation in the mouth and oropharynx can cause squamous cell car carcinoma. Chronic inflammation in the distal esophagus can cause Barrett's esophagus and later on adenocarcinoma. Uh, 
We saw chronic gastritis causing gastric adenocarcinoma. We saw UC causing uh, colon cancer. So I just want you to keep in mind, whenever you hear chronic inflammation, I want you to think of cancer as a potential sequelae of that inflammation. And the last thing I want to talk about is rare but important. Uh, splenic vein thrombosis is often associated with chronic pancreatitis. So what's happening here? If this is our pancreas and this is our spleen, we have our splenic vein that runs right between the pan right in the middle of the pancreas. If you have inflammation of the pancreas, especially chronically, what can happen is that inflammation can also start affecting the blood vessel. And over time, that inflammation can cause a thrombosis. And if you have a splenic vein thrombosis, because blood is coming from here all the way over here, you could actually get a backflow here and you'll get splenomegaly. And an important, not an important note, but something I, I discovered, I thought it was interesting is that half of patients with chronic pancreatitis develop splenic vein thrombosis. So it's very common in that population. Okay, moving on, we'll talk about pancreatic insufficiency. So pancreatic insufficiency is caused by decreased production of necessary pancreatic enzymes. So as you know, we are ACE in our cells to create zymogens into the lumen, and those zymogens go into the duodenum where they are converted into active proteins, proteases, and lipases. But in pancreatic insufficiency, we secrete less of these zymogens, and we end up ultimately having less active proteases and lipases in the lumen. This can be caused by a number of different factors, uh, cystic fibrosis, chronic pancreatitis, pancreatic surgery, and cancer. So in cystic fibrosis, what happens is that, as we know before, our ductal cells are responsible for secreting bicarbonate and other components of pancreatic fluid. And part of making this process works requires a functional CFTR protein. And so if you don't have a functional CFTR protein, you have a few things happen, but ultimately what's going to be the end result is that your lumen will become viscous, as you can see here, and nothing can get through. It's kind of like a sludgy material. And because of that, you're not gonna have the free flow of proteases and lipases into your lumen. In chronic pancreatitis, uh, we just saw this a second ago, what's gonna happen is this chronic inflammation here will damage the pancreatic tissue and you'll lose a lot of the ability of the ACE in our cells to produce your pancreatic enzymes. Pancreatic surgery is pretty self-explanatory. If you don't have a section of your pancreas, you're obviously not gonna have a, a lot of your, some proportion of your pancreatic enzyme potential. And in pancreatic cancer, what can happen? A few things. The cancer itself can destroy your ACE in our cells. So it would have the same effect as pancreatic surgery in the sense that you are losing ACE in our cells. So you're losing enzymes. You can also have the cancer obstruct a lot of the outflow tracts. So even if you have some functional ACE in our cells, you'll still run into the problem where they, the zymogens can't escape into the duodenal lumen. And how this will present, it'll classically present with diarrhea, which is fatty, fatty stools, as well as fat malabsorption. So this is from our small intestine lecture about how fats are dissolved and absorbed. Basically, you, you'll have these big fat cells they're gonna get emulsified by this amphipathic bile. And after doing that, these pancreatic proteases right here can start to chip away at these fat globules and they'll ultimately decrease them in size as they keep working at them. And once they're this small, they can be absorbed into enterocytes as mycelles. The problem with if we have pancreatic insufficiency, we don't have any of those lipases anymore. So these globules can't be converted into a size that fits into enterocytes. So we have these large globules, they don't fit in here anymore. And so they're just gonna keep traveling down the intestine and ultimately you're gonna, uh, these will be excreted along with the stool. So you'll get theaterrhea. Any, any condition that can cause fat malabsorption can also cause fat soluble vitamin deficiencies. So I've talked about this quite a bit in other lectures, but I always like to remind you that vitamin A deficiency usually presents with night blindness and some skin changes. 
Vitamin D is commonly associated with hypocalcemia and bone problems like osteoporosis. In vitamin E deficiency, you'll get hemolytic anemia. It's probably the most important uh, symptom to realize. And then because vitamin K is a cofactor for a lot of our clotting factor synthesis, if you have deficient vitamin K, you're at risk of bleeding. Pancreatic insufficiency can also lead to vitamin B12 deficiency. From our framework that we've discussed now in a few different lectures, here is our vitamin D absorption. And I don't wanna go through the whole thing, I just wanna point out here that pancreatic proteases are essential for this process because they actually cleave the interaction between B12 and R binder to give you a free B12. And this free B12 in your small intestine will then bind to intrinsic factor and it'll travel to the terminal ileum and get absorbed. If you don't have this protease here, you're gonna have the B12 stuck to R binder and this complex cannot be reabsorbed in the terminal ileum. So that's why you need these. And in pancreatic insufficiency, you obviously don't have enough proteases entering your lumen. And I think that's what this just says here. So moving on to the diagnosis and treatment. So there's a few different laboratory values that you should know with pancreatic insufficiency. You can have decreased duodenal bicarbonate. So remember the pancreas is important for secreting bicarbonate in the presence of secretin, as we've talked about. And so if you have pancreatic insufficiency, you're not secreting as much bicarb. So it should make sense that if you don't, if you have a, a dysfunctional pancreas, you're gonna have decreased duodenal bicarbonate. Another thing you'll see is decreased fecal elastase. So elastase is one of the pancreatic enzymes that is secreted into the lumen of the duodenum. And so here in a normal functioning pancreas, you'll have a ton of enzymes and some one, let's say the yellow ones are the elastase enzymes. You're, you can detect this enzyme in the stool to some extent. Whereas in pancreatic insufficiency, you're not gonna have as much of that detectable in the stool. So that's why you have decreased fecal elastase. The fecal fat test is pretty self-explanatory. It's just testing for the presence of fat in your stool. So going back to our slide earlier about steatorrhea, this is fatty stool. So this would be a positive fecal fat test if you ever detect any of these fat globules that make it all the way to your stool. And the last one I wanna talk about, and probably the one that's tested on most, is that in pancreatic insufficiency, you'll have a normal d xylose absorption test, meaning that d xylose is detected in the urine. So let's break that down again. We talked about this once in the small intestine lecture, but basically here is how simple monosaccharides are absorbed in our, in our lumen. So this is the lumen of our duodenum. And you know this would be the basal lateral layer and into the bloodstream. As you can see, these, these simple monosaccharides just require intact intestinal mucosa to work. So the d xylose absorption test can be used to distinguish between GI mucosal damage or another cause of malabsorption. So xylose, let's just assume xylose is one of these monosaccharides. All you need to get this monosaccharide all the way into your bloodstream is an intact mucosa. So you just need this, this cell basically. As long as this cell is working, you should have xylose being able to be re reabsorbed, even if you don't have anything else going for you. So how they do this is they'll give somebody a load of d xylose and then they'll check their urinary d xylose levels. And how you interpret the results, if d xylose was detected in your urine, then that means this d xylose molecule went from the lumen of your intestine into the intestinal mucosa and out into the bloodstream, and that would ultimately be excreted, in the, and you'll see that in the urine. So if you have d xylose detected, that means d xylose was absorbed appropriately, which means this whole section here is working. This whole cell, in fact, is all working. And so if you know this intestinal cell is working, that should lead you, point you in the direction that, okay, maybe the intestine isn't the problem. So that suggests that it could be something like pancreatic insufficiency that may be causing some sort of malabsorptive pattern for other compounds. If d xylose was not detected in the urine, then obviously d xylose wasn't absorbed in the first place. So then you can start to realize, okay, maybe the intestinal mucosa is the problem because that's all you need for d xylose to be absorbed. And again, this would 
lead you to the direction of an intestinal problem like celiac disease. In the case of what we're talking about, pancreatic insufficiency is you can notice that d xylose was correctly absorbed in this cause. So that's why you'll have a normal d xylose test in pancreatic insufficiency because the intestinal mucosa is not the problem. It's the actual pancreas. You treat this, it's pretty self-explanatory. If you don't have enough lipases and proteases in your lumen of your GI tract, you need to replace it with pancreatic enzymes. And that's all you need to know about pancreatic insufficiency. Let's move on to pancreatic cancer. So pancreatic cancer, like most of our GI tract cancers, is an adenocarcinoma, and it arises from those pancreatic ducts that we talked about earlier. It's usually located at the head of the pancreas. And so from our anatomy section here, we talked about this being the head of the pancreas. And the relevance to this is that you have your main pancreatic duct that kind of goes like this, and you also have your common bile duct that ends up attaching to it in this pattern. And so if you have a cancer blocking this region, you're, you're not only going to have pancreatic duct problems, but you'll have your common bile duct getting obstructed too, which may cause jaundice. So risk factors for pancreatic cancer, it's often in older adults. Uh, a big risk factor is smoking. It's very common to see that on a question stem. You can also get pancreatic cancer with diabetes. Certain races are at higher risk, including African-American and Jewish ancestry. Uh, a big risk factor they do test on occasionally is chronic pancreatitis. So if you have chronic pancreatitis, you are at increased risk of pancreatic cancer. I just want to point out, though, that alcohol is not directly associated with pancreatic cancer. Obviously, alcohol use can cause multiple bouts of acute pancreatitis, which can lead to chronic pancreatitis. And in that setting, then the chronic pancreatitis would be a risk factor. But independently, alcohol use is not associated. Some genetic associations you should be aware of, and they do test these, is the KRAS and S SMAD4 mutations. I've seen this several times on a test where they'll give you a classic pancreatic cancer, and they'll ask you what what's a risk factor for it, and they'll include alcohol use, and then they'll give you like an SMAD4 mutation, and you, you'd have to re remember that alcohol is not a risk factor, but this one is. You can also see BRCA2 mutations uh, causing certain hereditary pancreatic cancers, especially of Ashkenazi Jewish descent. So let's talk about the presentation of pancreatic cancer now. The classic demographic, it shouldn't surprise you given the risk factors, they love to test you as an older individual with a significant smoking history. Nine times out of 10, this will be the demographic given if they're trying to point you in the direction toward pancreatic cancer. Another thing I want you to realize, um, and sometimes this is tested, is if you have an elderly individual who has new diabetes, especially if they don't really have risk factors for type 2 diabetes, they're usually kind of almost cachectic, they're almost in the other direction. And if they develop diabetes and weight loss and a few other symptoms, you should be considering pancreatic cancer. And so secondary diabetes, what's going to happen is if we have our ACE in our cells and our ducts, we also have islets of Langerhans that exist all throughout our pancreas. And if you have a huge pancreatic cancer starting to grow, you can start to diminish the functionality of these islets of Langerhans and you can develop secondary diabetes. So this will present like most cancers do with, with weight loss and anorexia. You'll have epigastric abdominal pain and you can get this obstructive pattern, obstructive painless jaundice, pale stools and dark urine. And we'll go over each of these three now. What I wanted to mention here is that and we'll talk a lot about this in the hepatobiliary section, is that bile is formed from a few different components. And what's going to happen in, in this case, especially in the case of jaundice, is that bilirubin getting stuck inside of our bloodstream instead of being excreted into the duodenum is going to cause a lot of different symptoms, including these three up here. So again, I, I'll go over this in the hepatobiliary section. And this is a good time to go over it, I think, because... When I was studying for step one, I feel like sometimes all these symptoms seemed like they were disjointed, but these, you're gonna see all of these symptoms, including many more in any pattern that obstructs your common bile ducts. So these are gonna be very common, this, this clinical presentation. So pancreatic cancer can cause these for a few different ways. We'll start by talking about 
why pancreatic cancer can cause jaundice. If you have a pancreatic mass blocking this outflow tract, then this bile cannot escape to the duodenum. And instead, that bile is going to leak out into your bloodstream. And any time you have conjugated bilirubin or unconjugated, actually, anytime you have bilirubin in your bloodstream, that can lead to jaundice or yellowing of the skin. Uh, pale stools arise for a similar mechanism. What's going to happen here is that we need the bile to reach our GI tract in order to provide that pit brown pigment in our stool. So if, again, if we have this pancreatic tumor blocking this whole pathway, what's going to happen is that the stool cannot turn brown and it'll stay pale. For dark urine, what's going to happen here is that in under normal circumstances, our red blood cells break down into bilirubin in our blood. And this bilirubin is unconjugated. So if this bilirubin tries to escape, it's going to get stuck uh, in the kidney and, and secreted back out into the bloodstream. And I remember unconjugated bilirubin as being water unsoluble to remind me that it cannot be excreted with the kidneys because the kidneys need water soluble compounds to be excreted. What's going to happen? So how do we fix this? How do we get this bilirubin out? Is our liver is going to take over and it'll convert that unconjugated bilirubin into conjugated bilirubin. And from there, that conjugated bilirubin, as we saw before, that can be excreted along inside that bile. That's a, that's a component of bile. But what's going to happen in pancreatic cancer or other obstructions is you're going to have a big blockage and that conjugated bilirubin now will get secreted back into your bloodstream. And this conjugated bilirubin is water soluble. So it can actually get excreted in your urine and you'll end up with dark urine because of conjugated bilirubin. You'll also get steatorrhea, which shouldn't surprise anybody. You're gonna have fat malabsorption for some of the same reasons we've already talked about before. I can show you some right here. So steatorrhea are fat greasy stools and they're often caused by excessive fat. So if we have our pancreatic enzymes here, they usually get excreted, I mean, secreted into your duodenum and fat can get broken down into smaller myceles. But if you have a big obstructing mass or you have a mass that's destroying a lot of your ACE in our cells in the first place, then you won't have as much pancreatic enzymes in your lumen and you'll have these large fat globules that cannot be absorbed and instead they, they end up being excreted as feces. On physical examination, there's a few things they like to test. There's something called the Corvosier sign, which is a non-tender palpable gallbladder. So why does this happen? So what's happening here is that we've seen this process many times now that bile likes to flow out this outflow tract. If we have this blocked, what's gonna happen is that sure, some of that bile does escape into the bloodstream like we've seen many times so far, but some percentage of that bile ends up getting stuck in the gallbladder or pushed back into that gallbladder. So over time, you're gonna actually have a growing gallbladder because you have so much bile stuck in there. And I remember this as the Corvoisier sign is the gallbladder becomes curvier in Corvoisier because it's a non-tender palpable gallbladder. Another uh, syndrome you should realize that's associated with pancreatic cancer is Trousseau syndrome, also known as migratory superficial thrombophlebitis. Uh, this is caused by multiple blood clots in your usually in your extremities due to a hypercoagulable state. Most cancers do cause hypercoagulability. And here you can see Trousseau sign is all these mini blood clots here. And for this one, I remember Trousseau as thrombophlebitis. A few more tidbits about pancreatic cancer before we move on. Just know that if you're testing laboratory studies, uh, CA199 is the most useful to monitor the response to treatment. You can also use CEA in some capacity and some oncologists use that, but see if you're on a test and they give you both of these laboratory markers, uh, CA199 will be correct. For imaging, you can use a CT scan or an MRI to, to diagnose the cancer. And the treatment is a Whipple procedure and the, a Whipple procedure is a very extensive procedure where they take out the gallbladder, part of the stomach, your duodenum, the head of your pancreas, and they have to attach this to the distal portion of your intestine. It's a mess. I had to actually rotate it 
during my surgery rotation I was part of a Whipple and it took like 10 plus hours and I'm not a big surgical guy so but it, it, interesting nonetheless and that's how you would need to treat it you'd need to treat it with the Whipple and then you'd still need chemo radiation and all that jazz and I think that's what's next yeah so treatment is Whipple and chemo radiation and even if you have all of this standard of care going for you, pancreatic cancers are still very, very dangerous, even early stage pancreatic cancers. So the prognosis is very poor and your the average survival is about one year after diagnosis. Now we'll uh, switch gears and talk about some pancreatic islet cell tumors. So these are neuroendocrine tumors that secrete excess hormones. Uh, the treatment for these is usually octreotide or surgical resection. And this should some make some intuitive sense to you. We've talked about how somatostatin can just turn off all the hormones. So if you have a neuroendocrine tumor secreting excess hormones, it kind of makes sense logically that somatostatin might be able to turn it off or octreotide is the drug, drug name of somatostatin. These tumors are associated with MEN syndromes, which we'll talk about as well. This is from our either our, no, this is from our endocrine pancreas, kind of our pseudophysiology section of this lecture. And what I've mentioned is that we have several different hormones secreted by alpha, beta, delta, and other cell types. And I wanna highlight the five hormones that we've already talked about, because these are the five hormones that, caught, that are responsible for the main pancreatic islet cell tumors. So let's start with glucagon and the associated glucagonoma. So glucagonoma is an alpha cell tumor causing glucagon overproduction. And first aid has a pretty decent mnemonic. I think glucagonoma is pretty low yield, but when, when you get tested on it, you're going to be very confused if you don't remember the mnemonic. So I just wanted to throw it out there. You're going to have diabetes, which should make sense. Insulin drops your blood sugar and glucagon is the opposite. So it's going to increase your blood sugar. You're gonna get this dermatitis and they do like this phrase. If I would remember one thing on this whole slide on glucagonoma, remember this necrolytic migratory erythema. That if you ever see those words, I would highly, highly recommend you pick glucagonoma. You can get diarrhea, declining weight, you can get DVTs and depression. So it's kind of a random mnemonic. And to be honest with you, it's not one that I've spent a lot of time memorizing but I have been saved a few times by remembering that necrolytic migratory erythema in the setting of glucagonoma. Insulinoma is much more heavily tested because they can test you on the mechanism of beta cell production, insulin secretion, as well as how to differentiate between this versus exogenous insulin use versus sulfonylurea use. So let's go over all that right now. As you probably predicted, an insulinoma is a beta cell tumor that causes insulin overproduction. You're going to get symptoms of hypoglycemia. So you'll have lethargy, syncope, fatigue, tremor, seizures. And this should, again, make sense because insulin drops your blood sugar. So what are you going to find on lab? So you're going to find elevated insulin. You're going to find low blood sugar, as we just discussed. And the important thing is that you're going to find elevated C-peptide. And we'll go, we'll go over what C-peptide is again. Uh, we talked about it in the endocrine pancreas, but I'm gonna go over it in great detail. So let's start with the question stem to get this uh, so everybody's on the same page. We have a 34 year old woman brought to the ED after losing consciousness. Her blood glucose on arrival is 48 and normalizes after receiving IV dextrose. And 48 is, is low, you don't want it to be that low. Uh, laboratory studies reveal elevated insulin and decreased C-peptide levels. What is the most likely diagnosis? And they'll give you type one diabetes. They'll ask you if they're taking a sulfonylurea, insulin, do they have an insulinoma or are they injecting insulin exogenously directly into your bloodstream? So let's go over what is happening in this spot and then we can answer that question. So we've already gone over this in the endocrine pancreas lecture, but I'll briefly go over it how insulin is secreted. So we have glucose in our bloodstream. It enters our beta cells. It's converted to ATP and it'll inhibit this potassium channel. Remember this potassium channel is trying to pump potassium outside of our cells. By doing that, the outside of our cell would become more positive here as you're losing potassium. 
inside would become more negative and it'd be actually hyperpolarized, so less likely to have an action potential. In the case of glucose and ATP, you're gonna have inhibition of this channel. You'll have a ton of potassium coming in. This will cause the cell to depolarize and it'll cause calcium to enter the cell and that can help facilitate these release of vesicles into the bloodstream, which contain insulin, which is physiologically great because in times of high sugar like this, you'll have high levels of insulin. So everything's working fantastically. A couple things I want you to think about though, is that A, sulfonylureas are a type of drug that can inhibit this potassium channel to facilitate the release. So it'd be the exact same process here, just like ATP would inhibit this channel, the drug can directly inhibit this channel. Another thing I want you to consider is that C-peptide gets released anytime this beta cell can secrete insulin, C-peptide is released with it. So this right here in this vesicle, there's also C-peptide getting released and we can measure that in the bloodstream. This can happen in a few different ways. First, it can happen in natural insulin production like we just talked about, where you have glucose converting to ATP, and then potassium is in your cell, calcium. You have a vesicle releasing everything. So that's that's perfect, that's one way. Sulfonylureas can also cause this because as we just discussed, they block the same channel, which will have an increased potassium in your cell. P calcium would get released, release a vesicle, and there you go. You still have this natural beta cell secreting insulin. The third way by which you can have this C-peptide released is when you have an insulinoma where you have a ton of uh, beta cell release of insulin, but because it's natural, you'll still get the C-peptide. So here's an insulinoma, you'll have a ton of, you might not even need that whole depolarization because the cell's already just producing all these vesicles without any regulation. But because you have all this insulin being released by your beta cells directly, you're also gonna have a ton of C-peptide within that. So just to review, in, in an insulinoma, you're gonna have high levels of insulin, as you can see here. You're gonna have decreased blood glucose because all the insulin's in your bloodstream, and you're gonna have elevated C-peptide. What happens if you're injecting insulin though? So if you inject insulin directly into your bloodstream, sure, you'll have a ton of insulin in your bloodstream, but your beta cells are not actually producing the vesicles to produce this insulin. So because of that, you're not getting C-peptide in your bloodstream. So you're gonna have elevated insulin, you're still gonna have decreased blood glucose, but the caveat here is that you're gonna have decreased C-peptide because your beta cells aren't producing that insulin directly. And let's go over the third cause. What about a sulfonylurea? So if you're taking a sulfonylurea, it's gonna block this, we've, we've talked about this mechanism. And again, you're gonna have a ton of C-peptide being released. So you'll have elevated insulin, low blood glucose, and elevated C-peptide levels. Now, these three findings should be familiar to, to you because they're the exact same three findings as you'll see in a natural insulinoma. So how do you, we've talked about how you can differentiate exogenous insulin use from an insulinoma by the C-peptide level. How do we tell the difference between an insulinoma and sulfonylurea use? Well, fortunately, we do have a test called the secretagogue screen, which can detect sulfonylureas in your blood. And so if you have a positive sulfonylurea, a positive secretagogue screen, that means that you have intilk sulfonylureas. And if you have an insulinoma, you're going to get a negative secretagogue screen because you don't have any sulfonylureas in your system. So let's go back to our question now. And with the information we just learned, we should be able to answer this so what's going to happen here is that, in well, first off, we can rule out type 1 diabetes because type 1 diabetes has the opposite problem. You actually have decreased insulin and hyperglycemia. So we can rule that one out. If we talk about sulfonylurea use, you're going to have elevated insulin. You're going to have elevated C-peptide. And then the question stem, this person has decreased C-peptide levels. And you'll also have a positive secretagogue screen if you need to differentiate this from an insulinoma. So we know that's wrong. How about an insulinoma? What's gonna happen here is you'll have elevated insulin, you'll have hypoglycemia, but again, because the insulin is being 
uh, manufactured within your beta cell directly, you should have an elevated C-peptide. And in this case, this woman has a decreased C-peptide level. So we know that's wrong. And so that makes exogenous insulin use the correct answer here because of the decreased C-peptide level. Let's talk about somatostatin OMA. So this is a delta cell tumor causing somatostatin overproduction. We know somatostatin is our stopping hormone, so it turns off all these hormones. So all these hormones here, glucagon, insulin, secretin, gastrin, CCK, GIP, those can all get turned off in a somatostatinoma. So your symptoms are going to be associated with decreased production of each of these hormones. So if you have decreased glucagon or insulin, you can either have glucose intolerance or diabetes. It can be one way or the other, depending on which one gets turned off more. Uh, cholecystokinin is important for gallbladder contraction and the movement of bile through that common bile duct and out into your lumen. So you can get fat malabsorption if you don't have enough bile entering your duodenum. You could also have gallstones start to form as the bile just sits there in the gallbladder. You have a higher risk of forming gallstones. And then gastrin, we know gastrin is our gas pedal for our stomach, it basically, it turns on our stomach, it increases the mucosal thickness, it increases hydrogen acid secretion. So if you have decreased gastrin, you're going to have decreased HCL in the stomach or achlorhydria. And you treat this either with surgical resection, or you can treat it with octreotide, which is very interesting how this, this tumor produces excessive somatostatin. And in order to treat that, you can give them somatostatin. I don't know how that works, but I'm just going to take it as, as fact. Let's move on to gastrinoma. So gastrinoma, also known, which can cause Zollinger-Ellison syndrome, is a gastrin-secreting tumor of either the pancreas or duodenum. How it works is that you have acid hypersecretion uh, because you're producing so much gastrin, and that acid hypersecretion can cause ulcers in your distal duodenum or jejunum. And we've discussed this before in our small intestine lecture. And so let me show you a picture of this. Normally we have, if you have an ulcer in your uh, gas, your stomach here, so a gastric ulcer, that's gonna be usually caused by either H. pylori or NSAIDs. If you have an ulcer in your proximal duodenum, that's almost always gonna be caused by H. pylori. But in this case, if you have a gastrinoma here, it can produce gastrin, this gastrin can uh, stimulate your parietal cells to produce a ton of hydrogen ions. These hydrogen ions can actually make it all the way to your distal duodenum or proximal jejunum because there's just so much to neutralize. And then these hydrogen ions can erode the lining of your intestine here and cause distal duodenal ulcers or proximal jejunal ulcers. Um, classically, it'll present just like any other duodenal ulcer. It'll give you abdominal pain that improves with meals. And again, this should make some sense. If you have unopposed hydrogen ions throughout your duodenum, that's going to hurt really bad when they reach these ulcers areas, and it's going to cause a lot of inflammation and pain. But if you eat, you can at least have some sort of bicarbonate production that neutralizes most of the acid that reaches the distal duodenum. You can diagnose this in a, uh, by the secretin stimulation test. So normally secretin suppresses gastrin release, but gastrinomas don't listen to the that signal. So it normally S cells, we've talked about this many times now, they do a few things. They produce pancreatic bicarb for us, or they induce secretion of pancreatic bicarb. And they also decrease gastric acid secretion. And the problem is that in gastrinomas, even if you have this, this large gastrinoma that's hypersecreting these hydrogen ions into your gastric lumen, even if you have secretin being produced, the gastrinoma doesn't listen and it just keeps producing all these hydrogen ions. And so how to test this is you would give somebody secretin and you'd see if their gastrin levels go down, which in this case, they would still stay elevated. So our last tumor we need to talk about, our last islet cell tumor is a vipoma. And so a vipoma is an overproduction of VIP. It presents with watery diarrhea and vomiting. Uh, 
And the classic mnemonic that you've probably heard before is this WDHA syndrome. And that stands for watery diarrhea, hypokalemia, and achlorhydria. And so I tried to break it down here. So this watery diarrhea is obviously here. And why is it called the hypokalemia and the achlorhydria are a consequence of, of the vomiting that happens. We talked about this in our stomach lecture. It's not too uncommon for other conditions like bulimia will also present with a hypokalemic, hypochloremic metabolic alkalosis. So let's talk about why that is. Hypokalemia is caused by all this, as you're losing so much volume through vomiting and through diarrhea in the case of dipoma, you're losing so much volume, your kidneys start to panic and they say, we need to keep volume at all costs. And what they'll do is that they'll retain sodium because they know that the more sodium in your bloodstream, that'll cause water to stay in the bloodstream with it. The problem is that for every sodium ion that you reabsorb into your bloodstream, you have to excrete a potassium. So you become hypokalemic. Achlorhydria should make sense. As you're vomiting out all this HCl into your lumen and outside of your GI tract, you're, you're going to lose a lot of this chloride here. That's the mnemonic that you're going to be tested, that, that almost all resources mention, this WDHA syndrome, which is helpful in some capacity. What I like to do, though, because it's kind of coming out of both ends, I always remember VIP OMA as very important potty syndrome. That's what, because you really, if you're having diarrhea and you're vomiting, then, you know, the most important thing in your life is a bathroom, right? So this will help, this helps me because then I just remember that, okay, I know it's diarrhea and I know it's vomiting. And as we've discussed previously, anybody who has significant vomiting will always have that hypokalemia, the achlorhydria, and you'll have a metabolic alkalosis. So that's not specific to bipolar necessarily. Now let's talk about some, some of the men's syndromes. So multiple endocrine neoplasia syndromes are a set of three different, well, there's more, but three testable syndromes that relate to random uh, neuroendocrine tumors. So we'll go over this. There, it's a hereditary disease and it affects your endocrine glands. It'll increase your risk of both benign and malignant endocrine tumors. There's MEN1, MEN2A, MEN2A and MEN2B, so three different syndromes that we're gonna talk about. And there's several study aids that I'm gonna to use to help you remember, because these are kind of a hodgepodge of random tumors. So it's good to start to have some framework to make it easier for your study. Each of these syndromes, whether it's MEN1, 2A, or 2B, they're all gonna have three main tumors you have to remember. The good news is that MEN2A and 2B have two tumors in common. So you really only have to memorize one other tumor for each. Another mnemonic that I've always used that's been helpful for me is that you're gonna notice that most of these tumors start with the letter P for whatever reason, and the Ps will decrease with each men syndrome. And what do I mean by that? That means men one, all three of the tumors that you have to memorize in men one syndrome start with a P. In men two A, two out of the three start with a P. And in men two B, you only have one of the tumors start with a P. I know this is kind of cryptic so far. I just wanted to lay the study aid framework as you're starting to learn that because it is kind of random, but it's good to, it's good to know. So let's start with men one. So what's going on? The, the genetic mutation for men one is the menin gene on pro, chromosome 11. And a good way to remember this is the men one equals men one and gene on 11. So there's a lot of ones in there. Just remember men and gene on 11. The three Ps that you have to know about for this one, there's pituitary tumors, parathyroid adenomas, and pancreatic islet cell tumors. And all the pancreatic islet cell tumors we just discussed can be associated with MEN1 syndrome. Sometimes they test about these angiofibromas, collagenomas, meningiomas, less like more low yield for sure. And to be honest, the men's syndromes in general are pretty low yield, but that's just something I just wanted to mention just so they don't try to trip you up. Men 2A on the other hand is due to a RET gene mutation. And so the tumors associated with men 2A 
you have your pheochromocytoma, medullary thyroid cancer, and these two we're going to see in both the men's syndromes. And you'll also see parathyroid hyperplasia. And some, uh, oh, I just wanted to talk about what a pheochromocytoma is while we're here. So a pheochromocytoma is an adrenal gl medullary gland that can secrete catecholamines like epinephrine and norepinephrine directly into your bloodstream. So here on the picture to the right, we have a pheo. It can secrete all of these catecholamines into your bloodstream, and that'll cause a variety of symptoms. It can cause higher blood pressure. It can cause pain or headaches. It can cause you to sweat, so perspiration. It can cause palpitations and it can cause pallor. And th because they don't secrete it continuously, it kind of comes and goes, you're gonna see paroxysmal symptoms. So they'll, they'll, you'll have these really bad symptoms for a little bit, then they'll go away, and then really bad symptoms, and they'll go away. And on tests, sometimes they test this as this, a form of secondary hypertension where somebody's on like three or four blood pressure meds and it's just not getting better. And they also have some of these other symptoms. I want you to consider a FEO in that case. Medullary thyroid cancer uh, is a tumor of the C cells or the parafollicular cells of your thyroid. And these produce uh, calcitonin and calcitonin tones down your calcium levels. So most people here are asymptomatic and you'll just notice a uh, thyroid neck mass. And you can diagnose this by increased calcitonin levels in your blood, or you can diagnose it by a biopsy. Again, I know this is a GI unit. I just wanted to point those two tumors out because they're kind of random. And they do test this one sometimes, this elevated calcitonin in the blood. Or they'll test it. You know what they'll do? They, they like to do, somebody has like a neck mass and they do a biopsy and it shows a overproduction of a substance produced by your C cells. They'll kind of give you the question stem like that. And you have to infer that that's medullary thyroid cancer. And sometimes they do it even worse. They do it even dirtier on you where they'll give you that somebody has a neck mass and the biopsy shows overproduction of a substance produced by parafollicular cells. And they'll ask you what other tumor is associated with a syndrome, including this tumor, if that makes any sense. They'll, they'll, they'll give it some haphazard way like that. So you'd have to know, okay, they're describing a biopsy of medullary thyroid and they want me to know what what other tumors are associated with it. So one of the answers might be a FEO. Just something to keep in mind. They have these weird ways of testing sometimes. Um, so some mnemonics that we should realize, the first two tumors there are the FEO and the medullary thyroid carcinoma. They're shared by both of the MEN2 syndromes. So you'll see these same tumors in MEN2B. And remember that with our three, two, one rule, MEN2A has two Ps. So you know the FEO and that, that's how you'll remember that parathyroid hyperplasia is the second um, P within MEN2A syndrome. Let's finish off this really kind of tough section because it uh, with MEN2B. So this is also a RET gene mutation, just like MEN2A was. You're going to have a FEO again. You're going to have medullary thyroid cancer again. But this time you're going to have mucosal neuromas instead of the parathyroid hyperplasia. Another thing they sometimes mention, I've, I've never really noticed this too much on tests, but they'll, they'll sometimes say it's, it, it'll give you like a marfanoid habitus as well. And so some mnemonics we're going to go over again. The men too share the same two tumors up here. And there's only one P, the pheosochromocytoma. That's the only thing that starts with a P for men to be. And because there's sometimes mentioned this marfanoid habitus, I figured you can remember men to be as men too big, just to remind you that this big, oops, this big marfanoid habitus is associated with men to be. Here's just a chart to make it easier for you to learn this later on. And just notice that men one here is the menin gene on chromosome 11, so a lot of ones. Also remember that the men twos have these two tumors in common. Here's our three, two, one rule where men one has three, two, three Ps, men two has two Ps, and men two B only has one P. And the last thing we just talked about, this marfanoid habitus is your men two B or men two big syndrome. I'm sorry, that, that section is always kind of a slog to learn, but I, I hope that makes it a little bit easier. It's not like you have to memorize it 
pulled necessarily. It's one of those sections where if you have so much other stuff to memorize, you might put it on the back burner, but it's good to revisit it just before uh, in case something tries to trick you on a test. There's not too many embryologic conditions with the pancreas, but we'll go over those right now. I wanna go over normal pancreatic development, and then we'll talk about two conditions, annular pancreas and pancreas division. So starting with normal pancreatic development, the pancreas is derived from your foregut, and it starts as two distinct buds. So these, these buds are in completely different locations, and then they'll end up fusing. You can see we have a ventral bud here and we have a dorsal bud here. So our ventral bud, will this will end up giving rise to our uncinate process and our main pancreatic duct. Whereas our dorsal bud will be the other part of the head of the pancreas, as well as the neck, body, tail, and accessory pancreatic duct. And that's located here. And so normally this, during normal gut uh, rotation, this ventral bud, will rotate and fuse with this dorsal bud and you'll have one pancreas. So it'll rotate and boom, you got one pancreas and there's your uncinate process right there. Everybody's happy. In annular pancreas, we have a problem with this rotation. So what's gonna happen is that instead of rotating like it's supposed to all the way around here, it kind of gets stuck on the part of the duodenum and it'll actually rotate it, so this is how it's supposed to be. This is perfect. This is not angular pancreas. In, in annular pancreas, what's going to happen is it'll get stuck on this part of the duodenum. And as it rotates, it'll just constrict it even more. And you'll have this, form, this uh, ring of tissue surrounding your duodenum. So what's going to happen if you have that is you could be asymptomatic, depending on how badly this constriction is. But you could get bowel obstruction because now you have a layer of tissue constricting your bowel and potentially compressing the lumen of your bowel. And so that can cause vomiting because of that bowel obstruction. You could also get feeding intolerance for all the same reasons. If, if food cannot travel past this section here, you're basically dealing with a bowel obstruction and you can't absorb nutrients as you need to. And that's because, like I said, if you have things coming in here, down the duodenum, you're going to get a... This, um, you're gonna get an impaction right here. And here you can see it again here. It's at the second or descending portion of the duodenum. And I talk about this in our small intestine lecture. You can have this ring of tissue that's just constricting everything and it won't allow food to get through this area. The last condition we need to talk about is pancreas divism. So pancreas divism, uh, just to give you an idea of when this whole rotation happens in this fusion, it usually happens in about eight weeks. And a good mnemonic to remember that the pancreas, ventral, and dorsal buds combine at eight weeks is using a pictorial mnemonic. If this is our ventral bud and this is our dorsal bud, just remember that they attach here at eight weeks. You can see the letter eight there forming. In pancreas divism, though, there's failure of bud fusion. So normally we have our pancreas rotating and you have a perfect pancreas right here. But in pancreas divism, you can see that they are two distinct parts. And what's gonna happen in this case? So this case, most people are asymptomatic, but you can get pancreatitis from this. Why is that? Well, remember that we talked about before the ventral bud, which becomes this one right here, this gives rise to not only our uncinate process, but more importantly, our main pancreatic duct. So this is the duct that is supposed to be draining most of our pancreatic fluid. In this case, if this entire region here is only able to exit through that small accessory pancreatic duct, you can easily get blockages or you can easily have a backflow of pancreatic enzymes that get stuck in your pancreas and cause inflammation. So this whole region has a lot of responsibility now. That accessory duct has a lot of responsibility and you can get pancreatitis if there's any problems with that. And I think that concludes, yeah, that's the end of this pancreas lecture. Thanks for sticking by for this. We'll talk about the hepatobiliary lecture next. But thanks for your time.